So Max, thank you for joining us on the Ballers Mindset. Obviously, you've just come back from your loan spell at Woken. How's the season been for you so far? Yeah, it's been, had some ups and downs in it. I went to Old Shot earlier in the campaign and unfortunately turned my ankle in the second game, which was a real shame because when I went down there, it was a nice environment, good players, good group of staff. And then fortunate enough to get myself out to Woking, as you mentioned, and I really enjoyed it. It was a good, really good spell. Good to get back playing again. Really good group of staff. Can't speak hardly enough about them and the lads down there. They've got a real good group. So I really enjoyed it. Wicked. So back to Northampton now. What's your plans for this season? Are you going to try and break in, get a few appearances under your belt? Yeah, just try and play as many minutes as I can, really. Um, the boys have had a really solid campaign and put themselves in a great position. I think we're 12th as of the results last night, if I'm not mistaken. I know Stephen and are playing tonight, so that might change. But mm. no, it's been a good season and I'm just looking to try and add to it. I've picked up my match fitness and my experience from going out to work and I'm just looking to add that to the group. Wicked. In terms of that, going back down to National League sides, how's that for you having played in League One now for this season and obviously League Two all of last season? It's been good. There's a, a bit of a difference in quality, but it's not as big as people think. I think that there's a lot of talent in the National League and Chesterfield have shown that. Teams like County and Wrexham going up last year and you know smashing this season have shown people that there's a lot more talent in the National League than people give credit for. We've heard that so many times. We've had previous guests on that have played National League and then have gone up, like Kyle Cameron, for example, skipper in Knox County. Mm. The level, people think it's a big gap, but really it's quite, quite even. I think it's a real mixture, yeah. You get some... Some players that really find it more comfortable in the National League for various reasons. It might be livelihood, it might be the less demand or less pressure than playing in the Football League. But as I say, there's a lot of players that can do both and a lot of players that can that have come down from higher leagues as well. So it just adds to the quality, like Will Grigg, for example. You know, guys played top end of League One in the Championship, if I'm not Especially. mistaken. Yeah, so they got loads more quality in the National League now than you had 10 years ago. Yeah. What would you say is like the biggest difference though from, I guess now because you kind of done a bigger jump, mm. Um, with being with Northampton, what is like the key difference that you notice when you go back down to the National League? Is there something that you like? I don't know. People, I've heard people talk about it before and they say like Ben Foster said before, like the goals that people can score in the National League is so much different because it's that less structured play. Is that something that you find or? I think I'd say play can be a bit more open. Yeah. yeah. I think that a lot of the game is based on decision making. So... <clears throat> As I say, the talent's very similar. There's a lot of people with the technical ability of football league players, but with the decision making might be a little bit slower. It might be a little bit different. So the pace of the game is a lot different as well. That's the one thing I did notice. There's a lot more teams in the higher divisions that have spells on the board and are willing to sit in a shape and hold and sort of sit in a mid block, for example. Whereas in the National League, I think games are a lot more open. It's a lot more fast paced. It's not, basketball is probably a better way of looking at it. It's not quite that drastic, of course, but it can be quite open, which leads to a lot of chances, a lot of turnovers, but equally you find your better teams like Gateshead who are getting on the ball and playing total football and obviously Chesterfield who mix it up, but have proved they've been really prolific this season. So awesome. I think, yeah, the game being really open gives attackers a lot of opportunities, which is why there's a lot of goals. So that's why I think it's a quite entertaining league to be in. Oh, for sure. Do you feel like your loan spell now has set you up for the rest of the season back in Northampton? Yeah, I think I've learned a lot in my short time. I mean, I played nine games in a row, which is for the first time in my career. So I was really chuffed with that. Picking up a lot of things, playing against some veteran strikers who have played in the league, played in lower divisions and a real hardy edge and a sort of more raw aspect in terms of, you know, they can play technically, but it's a more physical battle. Yeah which taught me a lot as a young centre-half trying to feel my way into those things. That's a great challenge for yourself, for sure. So obviously you made, made your debut professionally at 17 with Northampton. That was the season that they went down. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of reaffirmed your place in the first team squad at 19, right? Yeah. And then last season, promotion. How was that for you to get to experience that? No, it was amazing. <laughs> Just playing a simple, it was top. Uh, being a kid from Northampton as a fan when I was a child, going all the way through the academy. And then I think I played 18 games in the league, scored my first goal and got my first promotion in back-to-back -back games. I, I couldn't really ask so much more. Like playing on the final day at Tranmere and winning one nil and hearing the final whistle go and just the whole stand empty out onto the pitch and just jumping around my teammates. Yeah, it was it was different was class. Oh, it was I was amazing. about to touch on the goal. Obviously, I've got your Wikipedia up here. The one goal for Northampton. <laughs> Tell us that feeling from a boy who's played for the academy, come through the ranks. What was that feeling like? Please? Yeah, it was amazing. It's just a real shame we couldn't win the game. Um, well, a couple of mates said to me afterwards that like, I didn't celebrate it enough and I didn't. But all I could think about in that moment was we're drawing. And if we, we would have won that game against Bradford, we would have gone up. Mm. 
So all I had in the back of my mind was, no, no, we need to win. That mentality. Mm. It's just, the, it was just, the, I was so into the game. I wasn't really, you know, obviously scored and it was great. But all I could think about was, no, no, if we win here, we're going to go up. So I sort of half celebrated, then just ran back to the halfway yeah. line. So I was like, no, no, we need to get on with the game <laughs> now. To yeah. I was listening to something that you did um, earlier today before we came. And um, I think it must have been after the goal, but someone said, like, just to explain a little bit about who you are. You said, I'm Max Deitch, I'm a centre-back slash striker. Was that after that goal? <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not, I've, I've come on a few times up front in League Two and... I come on once up front this season, I think, mm. or a few times last year, mm. just to cause carnage, basically. <laughs> um, you can bag them then, yeah. yeah. Well, last chance <laughs> attempt, yeah. You know, it's it's something that I'm trying to build into my game is scoring goals. If I can be a defender that can add goals from anywhere, set pieces particularly, I think that's a good weapon to add to my arsenal. Going back to like the promotion season, um, obviously you've been at Northampton your whole career. Um, talk us through kind of where it all started, that progress that you made to where you are now, but then also, did that make that promotion feel any better, knowing that you'd been in this club since day one? As in the start journey through the academy? Yeah. So I joined when I was nine and come all the way through. I had my real breakthrough, my second year scholar, sort of lost, wasn't quite up to the standard in 15s, 16s, and scraped my scholarship literally in the last week of the season. It was the gaffer who was my youth team manager. And I sat down with him and the sports scientist and the academy manager at the time, Kieran Scarf, who's now at Peterborough. And we all just had a discussion and just sort of said, look, I'm a bit of a late developer and they were willing to give me the opportunity of having a scholarship, which I was more than grateful for, of course. And then my first year struggled to break into the youth team. They had a couple of players in front of me. And then my second year after COVID was when I really hit the ground running. Um, was on the bench of the first team in the, under Keith Curl in the first or second week of the season against Shrewsbury and then made my debut at 17 in that year against Crewe and then played Oxford in back-to-back -back games. So yeah, just sort of kicked on from there really. I've really got integrated into the first team squad for a good two or three month period and picked up a lot of being in the first team environment, the pressures, the experience of being around men rather than boys. And I think it made me grow up really quickly and I've really enjoyed that time period. I think it set me up well for my first couple of years as a professional. For that jump from the academy to the first team was a big jump for yourself? In different ways. I think there was a lot more demand on consistency as opposed to outstanding quality. There was a lot more physical demand, of course. I've still grown into my body. I still am now, but particularly in that period, I was going through a big change and I, I grew a bit and lost a bit of you know physical speed and agility. And that's a big thing I've always had to work on in my career. And the, but yeah, the biggest things that I found was, as I say, consistency, being a physical presence and just, just being a bloke, just coming out your shell a little bit more because a lot of young players can be quite shy and Too. get lost, yeah, and get sort of put under a little bit in first team environments. And I think that was a big thing that, you know, just having the confidence in myself to come out and act like a first team player, really. Yeah. Big up you. Mm. Well, we'll get into the one word game. Let's go for a little bit of fun. There's a couple of ones on here that we're, we've been asked to do by the fans and the followers on our uh, Instagram. So Sam's going to go into them all and she's going to give your first word reaction to what, what she's going to say, basically. Yeah, one word answer and then we'll come back to it. Okay. First one, football idol. Vidic. Next one, pre-match meal. <laughs> I've changed it actually, but at the minute, salmon. Salmon, nice. <laughs> Sean Dyche. <laughs> Dad. <laughs> it's obvious. Northampton Town. Childhood. Nick Cabamba. Goal scorer. Joker in the changing rooms. Where at? Northampton. Yeah, let's do Northampton. Actually, do both Northampton and Woken because that's where you most recently were. He gets on my nerves sometimes, but Leno, Mark Leonard, he's, he's funny. He's got a bit. He's sharp and Bowie as well. I say, but I have to, have to mention both of them because they battle for each other. Woken. Lad called Curtis Edwards, he's midfielder. He's he's just so dry. <laughs> just comes out with dry, quippy lines. He's yeah, he's good. And then the last one is you, Max Deitch. Aggressive. We oh, yeah. are finished on a solid one there. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna go into the football idol. You said Manu Vidic. Manu Vidic. For me, best centre back in the Premier League, in my opinion. 
people say Ferdinand Terry. One of. For you, was that your idol? Yeah, word? Ferdinand was up there as well as Carlos Puyol. Ooh. Used to love watching Puyol yeah, at yeah, Barcelona. Barcelona yeah. yeah, thought he was top. But no, Vidic for me, just because I couldn't really say the older ones. I wasn't old enough to... Adams. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't go back to them. I didn't watch them enough. Hmm. But Vidic was right in my ear of watching the Premier League and he was just a sicko. Yeah, and my I love that about him. Yeah. Is that clip of him like putting his head down? Just put his head through, through anything. Yeah, crazy. yeah. So I really looked up to him and, and you know, obviously Ferdinand, but him in particular playing at Man United. And you said aggression for yourself. Mm. So with that link into obviously what you've watched growing up, these hardcore defenders, is that what you try and now model your game around? Yeah, it's something I've always thought is important for a centre half and something that I've always agreed with is just going and tackling everything full tilt. Yeah. I think there's there's no point half ass and stuff, so you might as well commit and throw the kitchen Smash sink him. at it. Yeah. <laughs> if and I'll put your foot through That's it. That's it. Yellow card. Be right. You gotta take him every now and again. That's it. <laughs> Go on. Which one are we going to? We'll go Nicky Kabambo. Go on. Yeah, obviously I know he had last a, episode, had a yeah. little mention on the last episode of his word, his word for you was big head. Yeah. And he would be really accurate with that as well. We had to <laughs> we had to set up the panoramic lens on this camera here. And <laughs> get the ultra wide fish one. Was open you'd get a word in for him, but you said goal scorer. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, I've known, we grew really tight when we were at Northampton together and been really close ever since. Mm. Yeah, I'm just, I'm buzzing for him. Absolutely delighted that he's been kicking on at Barnet and he deserves that contract that he signed. I'm, yeah, just absolutely buzzing for him because he should be he should be up there. At Woking, did you face him against Barnet or did you not meet? Old shot I did. Old shot? Yeah, and he actually scored like against me on that day. Yeah, yeah, I was fuming. <laughs> yeah, How they, was that after? They won 2-1 and we scored. Yeah, actually we went for food afterwards and he <laughs> stayed at mine in London and I was, yeah, I was fizzing. Let's put it that way. He was pretty chuffed, as you can imagine. But no, I was, I was fizzing. But that was the night I did my ankle, unfortunately. Oh. So I was double gutted, got beat and did my ankle. <laughs> and so. he scored against me. Yeah, and he scored against me. So hat trick. Well, that's really interesting because we're talking about like when you were watching like prime Premier League, when you were saying that. And the big thing around that time was like, rivalry right between squads like when the when like Ferdinand would go to England they used to say that they didn't like to speak to each other because they were on different sides in the Prem How, do you think that's really changed now in terms of football because you're saying like you could play a game against someone then you're going for dinner with them he's staying at yours and you're having a laugh is that something that you think just fizzles out a little bit with football these days sorry I know that's such a u-turn no, but that's nice. no I think football's changed Definitely, there's mm. no doubt about it. And I think that the, as you say, the off the pitch stuff has changed a lot. I think that the cultures now are very different to what they were back then. And there's less divide. I think a lot of people are mates, but have the ability to compartmentalize that when they get on the pitch. Yeah. So, you know, they'll see people high-fiving each other in the tunnel all the time. Champ mm. you know, Champions League games when they have the tunnel and they have the camera on the players before, they'll be shaking hands and they'll be catching up with old teammates in the warm up. They do it at every level, non National League to Champions League. They all know each other. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that are really tight with each other in football, but, you know, they have the ability at that level when you get to the game, your head's on it. And I think that's quite nice to move on to your dad as a topic, <laughs> because someone that I would say is known for being quite old fashioned in his ways towards him being a manager, you can disagree. Um, maybe traditional when it comes to football and how he trains his team. So for you, growing up with him as your dad, what are your memories of when he was, what he was doing when you were younger, what you got to watch of him? Professionally or personally? Let's go professionally first. So professionally, it was amazing. Mm. So I'm a 12 year old kid at Northampton Town and every pre-season I get to go up to Burnley's training ground and watch him train for a week mm. and hang around with the kit man and print the kit <laughs> and pack the balls and pump the balls up and roll the lads kit up in a towel and give it to him in the morning and say hello and do the trivia question on the ball and stuff it's just it's just brilliant and to have that opportunity at such a young age yeah. really give me an insight and a goal to see no that's where I want to go because I want that for myself and yeah it was just magic every pre-season until my scholarship I used to go up I'd do my own running in the morning <clears throat> I remember in fact a couple of lads I saw when I made my debut, full debut against Oxford, I saw Daniel Adji. He was a younger lad at um, Burnley at the time when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I, he used to go up there and obviously I played against him. He actually scored in that game. I remember catching up with him after the game and he was like, God, I remember when you used to come for a season and do runs and stuff. Cause I'd, I'd do shuttles well before that I'd trained. Yeah. So I'd go and do my laps and my little ball work and my fitness <laughs> work. And then I'd watch training afterwards. So the lads would see me do it. And I remember one day I did the yo-yo run, which is his like favorite, it's his standard fitness test. So I was doing the yo-yo run out the front of the new building at the training ground. And he was watching it, me do it with a sports scientist. And I remember lads would come out from training, obviously showered and stuff, leaving. 
And I've walked past her, go on, son, go on then, keep going. <laughs> you wait till you get to my level and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, having that opportunity to experience that sort of environment at such a young age was magic. And I think it was invaluable to me. Yeah, definitely been beneficial to you mm. now growing up. Mm. Yeah, it was a major advantage. Just seeing all that, all those pictures and how much detail they put into everything, even just daily training really gave me an insight of where I want to go. How much in terms of when you were that young, did your dad have input on your game? Was he always like on you or did he kind of just step back and let you figure it out for yourself? Because obviously if you were with your own club, they have their own way of doing things. But what was his involvement kind of with your development in football? He's taken the same sort of route my whole life is that privately he'll talk and he likes to listen to what I have to say and then he'll give his input based on what I feed back to him. However, he's always stayed out of things between me and the club. So it'll always be, you know, if, if I've got an issue, I'll go and talk to the gaffer, mm. I'll go and talk to the coach because he's always brought me up of, it, well, it's my career and my development as a man as well to go and deal with these situations. And I think that's made me quite comfortable in a lot of environments. And I'm, you know, I'm not really bothered who I talk to. I just do what I do. So it's made me really comfortable in my own skin, which again, I think nowadays is a really valuable thing. But no, he, he'd had a lot of input on my career, of course. He's taught me a lot of things and I naturally gain a lot of things from him. So I think I'm quite a good leader and I'm a good communicator. And I think that that comes from him and him talking me and banging into me when I was younger about taking these little things on board and bringing them into training at a young age. And I think that's really helped me develop and sort of mold the player I want to be. Have you ever felt the pressures of being Sean's son? Anywhere you've been? Everywhere. Everywhere you've been. Particularly when I was younger. I think everyone saw him as a championship Premier League manager and thought, oh, this guy's going to be a world beater. And then they come and see me play and I'm, I'm not. And they're a bit <laughs> underwhelmed, not let's yet. say. Not yeah, yet. well, not yet. There's work in progress. But yeah, I think I felt it, especially as a child, you know, sort of until I was about 14, I reckon, when I went into the 15, 16s was where I got to grips with it a little bit more. More so people got used to me and seeing him in the back corner of training, watching training, that sort of thing. But yeah, I got a lot of heat when I was younger and I didn't really have a way of dealing with it until I got older. So I really used to struggle with it. Mm. Is that obviously a lot mentally on your shoulders at such a young age, coming through the academy, being where are you going in these loan spells? Mm. Such pressure on your <clears> shoulders. <throat> Do you feel like you cope with it well or could you have dealt with it better looking back? Yeah, particularly when I was younger, as I was saying, I could have coped with it a lot better, but I'm a kid and I was just learning my way. So I didn't really know where it lived. Yeah. But as I sort of matured and developed and entered different environments. So, you know, I went to Ketrin on loan and Brackley on loan, as well as Old Shot and Woking this season. Just being around different groups of, of men, being in different environments, winning, losing, experiencing a bit more life as well has taught me a lot about where that sort of sits and what you can look at and go, no, I can deal with that, that's fine. And, and what is crossing the line and that sort of thing. Mm. Last one, I think, while we're talking about your dad on, you know, we've spoken professionally, but more personally. Mm. Firstly, was football always the plan? For me? N yeah, knowing what you're, you know, with your dad, how, with football being his life, was that always the plan for you growing up? Was that something that you naturally just went towards because it was what you were used to seeing? How did that all work out? Yeah, well, I played, believe it or not, I was quite good at tennis when I was a kid. And <laughs> as, yeah, as weird as that sounds, tennis was my main sport until I was 12. Mm. Weirdly enough, yeah, I was, wow. I was used to play national tournaments and, and stuff like that. And I sort of sat down with mum and dad when I was that age. And it was sort of a decision really. We said, right, okay, you're gonna take one seriously and have one as a hobby. Yeah. And I ended up choosing football. I just love the camaraderie. Mm. I love being in a group. I love being around a team. And obviously I wanted to be like dad. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, why wouldn't I check the kitchen sink of football? And I think it was the right decision. I think, I don't know if I'd have coped because it takes a lot to just go and train on your own all the time at tennis. It's a very isolated sport. Whereas football, I think, as you say, you can move clubs everything's not solely on you. Yeah. So, you know, you can still have great team success even when you're having an off night, but equally on the flip side, you can be great while your team's not doing well. So it's a real yin and yang. Yeah. But I just love being around a group. I love the banter. I love being around the lads and having a few drinks and stuff like that. It's, it's, I think you don't really get that in some other sports. Yeah, yeah. So moving on to that Joker in the change room. Mm. Who, you said the Joker's in the change room, sorry. The group being around them, the social atmosphere, who was the joker that you did mention and why were they the best joker in the changing room? Yeah, so I said about Leno and Kiz, so yeah. two young Scottish lads, Kiz is from Fulham and Leno's at Brighton. 
they both just bounce off each other and they've got the proper Scottish accents. So what they say sounds more funny. <laughs> I don't, that's the best way I can describe it. So they'll, they'll do certain impressions and say certain things and it will just come off more funny than if I were to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've just got a good, a good way of delivering their lines and their timing's good as well. <laughs> that's an important thing. The biggest thing for me is timing and them, them two have got it nailed to a T. Is it just the punch lines or is it the pranks? What, what, what about that makes Yeah, sense? just some of it's just silly stuff. Yeah. Like it would just, there's not really a way of describing it. It's just sort of, you have to be there in the moment and they're really sharp at picking it up. Like kids is, kids is brilliant for names. So like if someone, you know, toes a pass, it'd be called like Toby Lerone or, or he's, yeah, like little things like that. <laughs> he's brilliant at him. He just comes up with them on the fly like that. And I'm, I don't know how he does it, but how, it catches you, me off guard. Where are you on that level? Are you hiding because you don't want to get picked on or are you there? Oh, no, all I'm, the I'm so comfortable with my own skin now. I don't really care what people say to me. I just, I just laugh it off. Yeah. I'm all part of, I'm all for the banter. Nice. You just got to find the kid that can't handle it and you just press yeah, it. You press keep him pressing him, you keep pressing him until he goes. That yeah. sounds like bullying, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all building character. That's it. <laughs> It's all Which one have we not done? Oh, uh, pretty much meal. Pretty much meal. Let's talk about salmon. <laughs> 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 After all of that, let's go back yeah, to the salmon. Not one of the most entertaining topics. <laughs> no, okay. Let's make the. Let's put a good twist on this. Then, obviously, football's been your whole life. When when did you realise that you had to start fending for yourself? And like, when did you realise that you had to like start cooking for yourself and looking after yourself? Like, do you feel like you had to grow up quicker? When was that kind of all hit you? When did that all hit you? I'd say first year pro. Mm. Yeah. I spent a bit more time away from home and last see I spent a bit more time moving around, staying at the clubhouse in Northampton and we lived there with just the lads. So you cook your own food or order in, depends what you want to do. Some lads order meal preps and stuff like that, but I le wanted to learn to cook. I just think it's a skill that I needed. And I started off with like doing my scrambled egg, beans and toast. That was my go-to <laughs> breakfast. That was my go-to pretty much when I was younger. And then, yeah, literally in the last six months, I've changed to having usually some sort of fish. But yeah, salmon's my usual go-to. TikTok yeah. recipes. Believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a good search and it, it comes up with endless things. But yeah, that used to be my go-to. So the first thing I learned was literally just doing scrambled egg, beans and toast. And then just, yeah, built on from there, really. I just tried to teach myself little quick easy recipes sometimes things are a little bit extravagant if i feel a bit brave <laughs> hopefully don't burn my house down but a few spices here and there yeah just a little bit to change up you know <laughs> can't even do scrambled eggs can't even lie away i'm all right you I know eggs I've, moved, I've already moved on from salt and pepper <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean to better season yeah this? better bigger and better things <laughs> he, was, he was playing we're gonna go on to the um host versus oh, guest no. now so Obviously, for everyone that's watching right now at home, we had previous rounds with Mark White and all these other guests that we've had on. So it's going to be the topic of current Premier League managers. So your dad, Sean Dyche, currently at Everton. So I get one point well, for that. Hang on. What if I want to say a, that I first? I have to get a bonus point being related to one. No way. It can, it can no be way. used in the game, so whoever's going first, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> oh, but yeah, so I'm going to get mine blank. <laughs> 20 current Premier League managers. There's going to be a penalty shootout back and forth. So should we rock, paper, scissors, two starts? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. It's on three, yeah? Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Yeah, okay. okay. I go first. So there's, a, there's an obvious one to go with there if you want that one. Can I go? Go ahead. Sean Dyche. <laughs> Sean Dyche, current Everton mm. manager, Max's dad. Pep Guardiola. Hide Guardiola. that, he might see it. No one can see that. Mikel Arteta. That's a great one back. Jurgen Klopp. Jurgen Klopp, last season at Liverpool. Who did you say just before? Ooh, good question. Listening. Emery. Oh, good evening. Chris Wilder. Chris Wilder, Sheffield United, nice. Company. Ooh, -hoo. Man City legend currently managing at Burnley. Yeah, they do. They have an interesting season. Yeah. Interesting season. Hmm. Trying to think if I should save anyone. Gary O'Neill. Oh, Gary O'Neill, that's a good answer. Nuno Espirito Santo. Eddie Howe. Of course she's gone for his. Who have you done? Oh, no, no, let me take it off. Nuno, who did you say? Eddie Howe. Eddie Howe, Newcastle, nice. Rob Edwards. Ooh. Doing a great job. Luton Thank Boss, you. nice. Mauricio Pochettino. Good shout currently at Chelsea. Not doing so well, you could say. Ange Postacogli. <laughs> I thought he was going to be bad at this. I know, but I'm actually, they're coming to me. I'm, I'm a bit done now, there's though. A, yeah, there's a, there's a couple that we're missing. I swear there's a, there's a couple of big ones that we're missing. Yeah. So there's seven left. You've done 13. You flew through them. 
There's oh, one. We've missed a big one. Like a top six manager. Yeah, isn't there? we've missed a top we've, six manager. We've missed a big one. Oh, no. oh Ten Hag. Ten Hag. Oh. Yeah, I knew we missed a top six manager. Ten Hag. Yeah, Manchester United. Oh God. Six left. You flew through a lot of the the top ones. Now it's the ones that I probably wouldn't even get myself if I was playing. <laughs> um, hang on a minute, yeah, yeah, yeah. hang on I'm a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can, uh, no, you can't ask for the club. You should have been listening. On the spot. There's a brummy that I'm thinking of. You'll get good at this one day. Hang on. How many are left? Six left. Six, damn it. Are we missing any obvious ones? <laughs> He's done. Uh, How many got in the bank, do you think? One, maybe two. Oh, nice. I think I'm done. I can't even think. You got to offer a stab in the dark, yeah. But I've gone blank on what on who we've said. Oh, well, I've, I've got one, but he's just... I'm not going to say it. If you're, until you're giving up, I'm not saying it. Oh, my God. Just throw the towel in. Yeah, I'm done. Put it wide. I'm done. Pulled it back to the box and she's missed the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Max Dice to win. Marco Score Silva. Marco Silva. Ding, ding, ding. Which ones were left? Done. So, so who did you have in the bank? It wasn't, I was obviously going to save Roy Hodgson, but he's not there anymore. No. Do you know the new manager? I've forgotten his name. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Palace the Bournemouth manager. manager. I it's not, know that. The Bournemouth manager is Iriola. Iriola, yeah. That's yeah. a great one. Who else am I missing? It's the said Bournemouth a bit. Brentford manager? Oh, of course. Frank. Thomas Frank. Thomas Frank. Brighton manager? I should know oh, this yeah, Deserby, yeah. Yeah. weekend. <laughs> I should have read Did you go? <laughs> no. Uh, um, Deserby. Deserby. West Ham. <gasps> That's crap. He's killed himself. You there. have to get him. Come on, you've got to know the I West Ham manager. I do, I David, do. David Moyes. Oh David my Moyes. And then the one at Palace now who replaced Roy Hodgson recently is Oliver Glasner. Yeah, I wouldn't have got him. I wouldn't have got that one. I wouldn't no, I wouldn't have got, got him. I can't believe I've got Moyes. Max Dice wins, so 3-2. Still to the host. Well, he's I don't think I put a bad performance from you. What do you mean, Paul? Didn't I put actually your best thought that forward. was pretty good. <laughs> you did all right. Average. So you said that when was playing, you mentioned <laughs> the Burnley manager. You said not having the best of season, having a bit of a weird season. For you personally, obviously your dad managed them. Is that like a second club for you? Because he was there for so long? No. Not really? No. I think that I've only ever supported where he's at. So, of course, I've got a lot of respect for the Burnley Football Club. They've done... Yeah. Obviously, my dad was there and they've given him an amazing opportunity, which has done unbelievable things for my life and my family's life. So we're forever having in debt to Burnley Football Club mm. and Watford to an extent for giving him the opportunity to get there in the first place. Yeah. But no, I don't have a soft spot for him anymore. Our first. So in terms of Premier League teams, have you got one that you support or? Well, really? Everton's the obvious choice. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I have a bit of a soft spot for Forest purely because I live there. <laughs> so I go, and, yeah, I go and watch Nottingham <laughs> Forest when I can. I went to the FA Cup run that they had the other year when they beat Leicester and Arsenal. Leicester that was Arsenal. awesome. Yeah, I, I, went, I went with my mates. <laughs> I went to every game. It was great. Yeah, that's when you get tickets. No, it's impossible. Yeah, it's a fair one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you'll find. <laughs> you still get yeah, you might I think be I'll right. find a way. Yeah, <laughs> something tells me I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. um, get me on. <laughs> Cam, I wanted to like backtrack a little bit. I should have asked you this when we were talking a bit more about your family situation, but more on the personal side. Mm. Obviously, you and your dad's lives are completely overtaken by football. How does that balance between your relationship now, now that you're kind of fully into your professional career, now that he is probably the busiest he will ever be? Um, how does that work and that dynamic between you and obviously the rest of your family too? Yeah, I mean, we've always been really close. Dad and I have always had a really close relationship and I don't think the football's got in the way of that. You know, Dad's been living away for since I was 12. So we've been used to doing this. This is a very normal thing in our family. And I think that's just brought me even closer to my mum. I've been spending a lot of time with her. My, although my dad's helped me with the football side, my mum's helped me with everything else. My God, I could not have done, I could not be where I am without my mum. And my sister actually to an extent as well. But particularly my mum, yeah, she take me from training every day dealt with when I used to come home and throw strops and be disappointed because I wasn't playing or couldn't handle the lads giving me crap at training or at school or whatever it was. And yeah, she's had the full brunt of it. Obviously dad's dealt with more professional side and when he's home, he comes in and, and helps out with that. But she's been a real rock for me. And my sister, especially in the last couple of years, we've gotten really, really close. And I think she's been the same. 
and it's really you know they've helped me through some tough periods mm. particularly in the last couple of years when I've been out of the squad or injured you can play a lot people will think undersell how much it can play on your mind it really it really can hit you and put you in some weird places so mm. yeah I've just been really grateful to both of them particularly that I've been so close to them and, and had their support throughout it that's it so you've had the support from your like you said your mum and your dad from your whole upbringing <coughs> do you feel like that again touching on like you now has that made you the player you are now the person you are now personally as definitely well? yeah i'm really fortunate to have both parents and have a sister that i'm really close with i know a lot of people have lost family members or don't quite have that relationship with their siblings and I think yeah it's it's a really big thing for me I'm really tight on my family and I'm, I really treasure that that's a really important thing the whole way through my upbringing and yeah I think it's given me two sides of the coin and I like to think it's made me a quite rounded person if I don't toot my own horn too much oh, nice. do you want to touch on that the Instagram question so we had um, a poll we put up on our Instagram for questions from the fans Northamptonshire football podcast reached out and they've got a few questions that their followers had so we're going to go to them now first one was preferred position along the back line so central left right or can you do do a bit of it all yeah either really. you're a striker so <laughs> well <laughs> yeah. I you it's a fair one yeah no I'm, I'm not too bothered i've played in the middle most of my life because i was the slowest so naturally i feel more comfortable there but i played on the left more recently the last couple of seasons but again i'm, I'm right for it i can play anywhere in a back three i'm not, not bothered as well getting them goals in yeah, every now and again <laughs> Um, what was your academy days like at Northampton? You touched on it a little bit earlier, but just for the followers that have asked the question, what was it like at Northampton at such a young age? Yeah, it was good. I got to work with a lot of coaches that have gone on to different things. Um, I spent a lot of time with Mike, Mark Lyons, who was a big influence of mine growing up. Still keep in contact with him now. He's a great guy. He's coaching Leicester's under nines, I believe, at the minute, and he loves it. Mm -hmm. And he's a top fella. And I'm, I'm really glad I kept in touch with him. Lee Garlic as well, another guy who's been had a sort of later impact on my career but going down younger there's a load of coaches that the um a two gentlemen called both called paul who are my coach at the same time one was the main coach one was the assistant um got on with them great i've, I've sort of had a lot of them uh, sam burt liam there's been a load of coaches like that obviously the gaffer when he was my youth team manager I had the pleasure of working with oh his, his name just popped up in my head steve morrison can't miss one now can you no i know i'm, I'm just scrambling a little bit now <laughs> Uh, he was manager of Cardiff. He he came in for a year before he went out and and got the job. And he was a really good fella to work with. Love spending time with him. Obviously, Rico and the coaching staff at Northampton now. Uh, Ian Sampson as well. So, you know, I've sort of had a a real mixture of players, mm. ex players, who have put their experience on me throughout my years. And I think that's been invaluable to my progression. Wicked. Jump it on. Is that that one? Who's that from? Oh, I just didn't much read it. Okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't put the names for them once. So oh, <laughs> that's why I was confused. <laughs> um, the next one is at 21. You've only just turned 21. How do you see yourself an eventual regular in the Northampton side? Yeah, I do. I think that next year is going to be a big season for me. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this season isn't over, and I'm hoping to get some minutes going into the last few games. But I think that next year is going to be important. I think now that I'm, I've played a few games in non-league, I think I'm at 50 senior appearances across non-league and professional. And I'm 21, so I think now's the time to really get my head down and, and try and kick on, try and put my name in this team and, and really take it in stride and get a regular starting position. So hopefully next year we can go and build even more from what we've taken out of this season. I've got like a bit of a follow-up from that. In cool. terms of like, there's so many routes into how people get into professional football whether it's like climbing the leagues um, or in your, t in your case, graduating from an academy. As an academy graduate, what are the difficulties in terms of getting that break? Do you feel like it's hard when you're in a squad that's now playing in League One where they've now got maybe more funds to be bringing in other players? Do you feel like you're seen differently within a squad that you've been at since you were 12? I said you were nine, sorry. Um, or, you know, what's, what is the difficulties with being an academy graduate that's playing professional football? Yeah, it can, I think a lot of lads will tell you that it's always difficult. It's great, obviously, for the club, having an academy graduate come through, but it's difficult to break the sort of mould of being a, young, being a young player into mm -hmm. a senior player. I'm not saying that I am a senior player, but I'm trying to put steps in place where I can get to that level. And that's always going to be difficult because people are familiar with you. They look at you 
can look at you as, you know, oh, I remember when you when you were that age. Well, rather than focusing on what you are now, which is always tough, I think that it's on me as well to try and do what I can to get in a team and break that mould. But I think it's important for clubs to not lose sight of developing their own players. I think that it's a real big thing for the fans as well as just the culture of the football club. If you can bring a lot of players through, like Chelsea are doing at the minute. I know they're buying lots of players as well, but they're putting loads of opportunities to the young boys and it really shows the power of the academy and shows that they've got a real pathway into the first team. Sort of similar with Northampton. We've had a quite a few players come in and you know get professional contracts from coming out of the youth teams. And Sean's the best example, I think, of a homegrown talent that's come on and stayed. So he's played loads of games for Northampton now. And he was an academy graduate six, seven years ago, something like that. Mm. So I think it really shows that there's a place to go if you're willing to put in the work. I think that's really important. That's interesting, though. Do you feel like that's something that clubs have started to devalue as time's gone on, you know, with so much money being thrown around the game now? Is that something you've noticed that, like, academy talent is being neglected slightly? I think that's a harsh way of putting it. Mm. I think that there's... It's a tougher environment. As you say, there's more money, so the pool's bigger. They get international players come in at a younger age. So, you know, big clubs obviously have more power to do this. So the smaller clubs with the lesser budget have more focus on developing these players and getting development programs in to give these players time to fully mature before they get thrown into a first team environment. But I think that part of the being uh, growing through a lower, a lower league club, sorry, is that you get put into that environment straight away. So you're immediately in sink or swim, which football is. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard place to get into. And once you're in it, you've got to fight and give your lot to stay in it. And I think it really filters through the players that really want it and don't want it. And you can, I think you can see it from a mile away if you watch a group who's really, really willing to give it their lot and who is just going to fall short. Uh, that's a big part of that period. Mm. It's filtering through those sorts of players and getting to the ones that either have the unbelievable quality or the attitude or both. When you say that, it reminds me of Ryan Yates of Forest. Mm. You've seen Forrest a lot. Obviously, you've seen Ryan as a Forrest. He's just like a warrior there because he's <coughs> been through the academy. Mm. He shows that he wants it more than probably some of the players that have come in mm. on the transfer. No, he's done brilliant. Mm. And you're right in terms of connection with fans as well. Like no one winds up a Forrest crowd than when Ryan Yates asks for it. <laughs> so like Trenton is unreal. So you, it is so true because, you know, especially for local teams, really local teams that have tight knit towns, you have to have that relationship. Is that something that you found you've built, you've built with the Northampton fans? Well, I'm trying to. I yeah. think, yeah, I think it's something that's, as I say, it's important for the town and it gives them something to get behind. I think if people bring in players from all over and constantly, you sort of might lose the identity of the football club in terms of what they are and, and what the town's about. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you keep a couple, at least a couple of people coming through the academy or people that have come through and are now first team senior professionals, it gives the fans something to get behind, I think. Mm. Is there any more? Um, the best advice to a young player hoping to make it. So from yourself growing up, what's the best advice maybe you got given that you could probably pass on in your experience? I'd say the biggest thing that I got taught when I was a kid was give it everything so that you can look back on what you've done and not regret it. So if you give your lot, if you throw everything you can at it, you, you can you can look back on it and say, I've done everything. I've done all my extras. I've prepared right for everything. I train properly. If you're still not good enough, I think you can be content with yourself. Mm. If you still get told a no, I think you can, you can take it. If you get to that point and they say no, and you think, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. Yeah, as long as, you don't, as long as you get to that final point and you don't feel like that, I think you can be pretty satisfied with what you've done. Mm. And you'll also learn a lot about yourself on that journey and where, how far you can push your limits because you can push them way further than you think. Do you feel like, sorry. sorry. Do you feel like going on from that, you're happy with what you've done? Have you got any regrets so far? I know you're only young yourself, still got years ahead of yourself. But is there any regrets so far? Or do you feel like you've done everything you can to this point? No, I think there's a couple. There's a couple of, there's a couple of silly ones, but there's a couple of ones that I look at and think, yeah, I, I wish that I would have done that sooner. And I think that, but also part of that is me growing up and I don't think I would have known those things at the time or wouldn't know how to deal with those things at the time until I've matured and sort of learned a bit more about myself. A lot of the things are to do with me and my outlook on the world. And I think that's changed in the last, a lot in the last 18 months. So if someone would have told me these things that I might say and do now at 15, 
they'd go way over my head. I wouldn't have a Scooby to deal with them. But I think that is an important part of the process. So regrets are hard way of putting at it. I think it's just for me a bit a big learning curve. I don't think I have any serious serious regrets, but there's a lot of things I wish I learnt sooner, for sure. But... Who gave you that advice? <laughs> Mum and dad. Yeah. Both of them. Just always instilled into me when I was a kid. Mm. Even at school. You know, I, I I did flunk off school a little bit when I was trying to chase my scholarship because I didn't have one and I had two months after the season. So granted, I put more time into football and took less focus on school, which I shouldn't have done. I wish I'd have kept at it at my schoolwork because I underachieved a little bit, I think. But they always said to me, just once you pick your path, if you don't put everything into it, then there's no point. Might as well not even bother. That's it. <laughs> this one's um, a fun one. <laughs> But I feel like... Go on, hit me with it. twist it a bit. Go on. So the question is, how do you keep focus on the pitch when fans may be chanting nonsense? <laughs> this one's been <laughs> sent in. But I wanted to ask, am I allowed to swear? Hmm? What's like the... What's like the... Have you ever played and you've heard a chant and you literally turn around and go, what the fuck are you saying to me? Like, like I've heard real, a chant that made me laugh. Like shithousery. Like what's the worst one that you've experienced playing? <laughs> I don't know. I've not really had any bad ones directed at me other than like, you know, you, you get C-bombed off and F'd off and all this sort of thing on the yeah. sideline, which is pretty standard. I'm not really bothered about that. <laughs> I had, there was a chant that, yeah, I was playing at, I think I was playing at Kettering and it's a really tight, Latimer Park's a really tight, like, pitch is terrible. It's a proper little non-league <laughs> ground and I loved it. And the fans are standing literally on the sideline. So if I'm taking a throw in where that camera is, you're, you're, you're a fan, it's mm. that close. <laughs> so they can basically touch you. Mm. And I remember picking a ball up and these fans are just going, look at the size of your in head, you and all this sort of thing. <laughs> and I just wet myself on the side of the pitch. I picked the ball up and I, was, I didn't want to stand up because I was crying with laughter. <laughs> and I had to compose myself before I stood up and took the throw in. But there's, yeah, there's, there's things like that that <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's such a silly thing. Yeah, yeah. But it just, yeah, it just that's one of the things that's crapped me up. That's the, the biggest thing I can remember about fans sort of giving me a little bit. And that was hilarious. I loved it. At least you could take it. So I'll try to try not to give a bit back though, isn't it? Yeah, I don't, I don't really bother with that. Yeah. I just like, I like laughing at myself and it was, it was really funny and it really caught me off guard, which is why I was wetting myself so much. In terms of like the noise on the pitch. So instead of the nonsense, it's like the noise of like a home crowd getting behind the team or an away end. Where's your best memory of that? Is it the Northampton away fans? Or is the home atmosphere even just as good? The best Northampton one I've had was obviously Tranmere when we got promoted. That was rocking the whole game. Granted, we scored in the fifth minute and we won the up the whole game. We're just, you know, sort of sitting in the mid block, shuffling it out and getting promoted. Obviously, that was incredible. The best one I've had other than that was, and other than Bradford when I scored, was Leighton Orient away. We had, this was the season we didn't get promoted. I think we won 4-1. And there was 1,700 Northampton fans packed on the away end. And it was, it was brilliant. They were on it the whole game. And it was top. The best atmosphere I personally played in was Bradford at Bradford. There was, and Stockport as well, actually. Them two in particular. Stockport at, at Stockport at Edgy Park. And Bradford at Bradford. There was 18,000 at Bradford. And we won 3-1, I think. I came on for the last 10 minutes. And they were obviously really loud. But Stockport beat us 1-0. Uh, two nil, and they were there was ten thousand. Then they were at it the whole game. It was so noisy. Like it's when we days, when we defended the main stand end. Yeah. When we were in the box on corners, and when they were clapping, you couldn't hear a thing. Like you were trying to shout at people, people just could not hear you at all. You like you have to run up to them and grab them and, and pull them where you wanted to them, them to go. So how did you deal with that? Like on your debut in front of a crowd, did you feel like it was hard for yourself to deal with, or did you feel like you coped with it well in terms of like? playing in front of fans? No, it felt pretty, well, mine was in COVID. Oh, it was right. just at the end of COVID. Okay. So there was only 2000 at Crew mm. and Oxford. It was when they just started letting fans back in. Mm. So obviously it didn't have as many as there would normally be. But no, I was, I was, I thought I was pretty cool. I thought I handled it pretty well. It was, it wasn't as big as a shock to me as I thought it would be. It just felt natural. I was so zoned in on the game. I just didn't really bother thinking about anything else. We're going to go and ask you your five aside all time team. Got your village and your poyol at the back, maybe. 
Yeah, I think I'm, no, I'm going to go one defender. Just because he's a defender, or will he go really defensive? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to go one defender. I'm going to go with. I'm going to stick with Vidic. Yeah. Five side team. I'm going to go with Van der Sar in goal. That partnership was a joke. Yeah. Him, him, Ferdinand, and Vidic trio. Yeah, that trio there was incredible. I'm going to go with. I've got a. He was before my time, really. But I love Omri. Omri. Everyone says Omri. I love Omri. <laughs> He's love Omri. an ab. He was a disgrace. I didn't watch him much because I was a really little one when he when he sort of was massive. Mm. But he was just unbelievable. I think I've got to have Messi in there. He's for me. He's the best player of all time. Just no, you can't not have him in your all-time team. He's just there's just no one that compares with him. It's an undebatable one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, you're an Aldo fan. I am, but obviously I grew up supporting Man U when I was yeah, proper young. Of course, so, so you got some spots for Man. Yeah, of course. I, I see the argument. But no, Messi's <laughs> Messi's on a different planet. Ronaldo's unbelievable. Messi's on a different planet. He's yeah, he's an alien. And your final plates. Have you ever seen Messi play? No. I thought he. Uh, yeah, I wondered. No, unfortunately not. I've se I've seen Ronaldo, but that's only because I was following him. Like a bit of a weirdo. But... At Man U. <laughs> nah, when he was at Real Madrid, to be fair. Were well, you? Yeah. 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 What game? It was actually at Leicester. They played like a pre-season game, but... Oh, that's wicked. Yeah, but they played the whole team. Was like, it at the King Power? Yeah, yeah. That's everyone was sick. there though. Ronaldo, nah, that's everyone. Awesome. I was buzzing. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> no, nah, that's proper. Yeah, I wish I could have seen Messi play. Say that like he's retired, but he's in America, so yeah. Difficult. Your final place in the squad. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a real tough one. I need a midfielder. Yeah, some someone in there to glue it all together now. Because I pretty much I pretty much pick Premier League, so I might just stick with the, I might just stick with all time Premier League because that's where most of my knowledge is, apart from like Jabbies and Iniestas. Mm. That's too basic. You can't be going there. That's an easy answer. Mm. I'm gonna go with. Now I want some goals. I'm gonna go with Frank Lampard. Over Gerrard. Yeah. <laughs> More is that goals. purely for the fiver side or in general? No, in general. Yeah. In general, yeah, I think they're both unbelievable. But I think I think Lampard's got an edge on him. Mm. I think he's just got a bit more. I don't know. It's a bit more. I think yeah, a bit more edge is a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think like he's. That. I think he just nicks him. Lots of things that I'm trying to pick up from the different groups and different staff I've been around, and the you know the limited football I've seen, but the football I've seen. I think there's a lot of things I've been trying to pick up, whether it's on pitch, off pitch, tactical, but a lot of things is just about the man management and how, how different people do that. And I think that's a big thing that's underrated in football is that people forget that they're still people. And the biggest thing that I've seen about teams that have success is when everyone's on board and everyone's pointing in the right direction. So they might not be happy, but they're all on side and they all know what they're doing. I think that's a big thing that, you know, eventually I want to try and implement into a team when I get on. Wicked. Well, Max, it's been an absolute pleasure. You really inspired me. I can see that you're going to go a long way in your career. You're only young, so you're going to go a long way with the mentality that you've got and the head on, head on your shoulders that you've got. It's, um, it's nice to see from a young player. We're going to leave with one word from you and an explanation on top of that. What is the meaning of football for yourself? Enjoyment. Happy place. Mm. Always has been. If ever I'd go home from school or, you know, especially when I was a kid, obviously, come home from school and beat up or had a crap day or flunked off a test or whatever it is. Like, even even now, yeah. when, I have, when I have rubbish days at a weekend, it might be football that's caused it, <laughs> but I want to go back in the next day. Yeah. Because I love it. And I know that might be youthful exuberance. I know there's a lot of players like, you've had Liam Moore and people that have had more experience than him, even, that come on the podcast. And yeah, they probably think it's a bit of a job now, but I love it. Always enjoy it. Always loved it. Everything about it. The, love the running, love the the passion, the just challenging. I, I prefer football when it's played properly. Yeah. When you sort of people go through the motions, it, that's when it annoys me. I like to just get at it and just go and play. Wicked. Let loose. <laughs> Let loose. Class. Okay, guys. Thank you for watching. Please comment below if you enjoyed that one. Like, subscribe, and share. This is the Ballers Mindset. That's a wrap.